Welcome to the Choosing Chair Podcast, the show about the joy of Jesus in all of life's moments. I'm your host, Nicolette Bell, and my hope is that you'll see His joy is not dependent on circumstances, but rooted in His presence. Let's go there together. Hey friends, I'm so excited about today's conversation. I'm here with my new friend, Brooke McLaughlin, and she is the founder of the ministry Million Praying Moms. Brooke, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It is a joy to be here. We have had such a um a long time making this happen. So I am so glad (laughs) to finally be here with you. Thanks for having me. Yes, I feel the same way. I feel the same way. I have um, followed your ministry on Instagram for a while now and have been so encouraged by the work that you do. So I'm excited for our listeners to get to meet you and get to know you. Can we start by you just telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure, absolutely. So I am a mid-40s mom of two. I have two boys, one, uh, well, they're just on the verge of their birthdays. And you know how that's important to kids. Like I'm, I'm really not 16, like I'm, I'm kind of 17. So, um, it's a big difference. So I have a 17 year old and an almost 19 year old, uh, one that's in his first year of college and one that's a sophomore in high school. I have been married, um, to the man I've had a crush on since the third grade for over 20 years now. And uh, we live in southwestern Virginia, kind of down in the mountains of Virginia. And we love this area of Appalachia. It's a rich, like the the history, the cultural history of this area is so rich musically, um, storytelling, all the things. There's just so much goodness here. And I always like to slide that in because I think sometimes people have a poor opinion of people from Appalachia when there is really so, so much wonderful stuff here. So um, we're happy to, you know, just be able to serve and, and love our family. We have a couple dogs and a, and a, a rescue cat named Nermal. So um, that is our story. Yeah, I've been doing ministry, uh, online ministry for a long time. Um, I started out in ministry working in nonprofit um, at an, in a nonprofit crisis pregnancy center. I uh, worked there for a very long time serving women in unplanned pregnancy. And um, then the Lord called me home for a season and I had the privilege of serving him here through online ministry, writing, speaking, and things like that. And it's just been one of the greatest joys of my life to get to do that. Yeah. Tell us about Million Praying Moms for those that aren't familiar. Yeah. Million Praying Moms exists to help moms uh, learn that prayer is not a last resort. It is not Mm. the thing that we do when nothing else works. It's actually our first and best response to the challenges of parenting, to the challenges of motherhood. And I would even go a step beyond that and say that it's our first and best response to the challenges of life. Um, Having that relationship with Christ, with God, is one of the best things. It is one of the, the places of the greatest joy in my own personal life, in my own motherhood. And um, and so I just, it spills out of me to help other moms see that God is inviting them into a partnership for the hearts of their kids. Um, when I was, we'll get into this, I'm sure more, but when my kids were very young, I felt very desperate for the Lord to do something in my home. And prayer was the way that God gave me to um be able to intersect with him and find joy in that parenting. And so uh, it's just a it's just a huge part of my heart for moms. Awesome. How did the ministry get started? So we actually, I, I used to have a ministry partner. We served together for a long time and she's still one of my dear friends. Um, but we started out kind of in a different ministry. We started out, we, we have five boys between us. And so we started out with this ministry called the Mob Society. Nothing nefarious about it. Nothing like bad, like it was mothers of boys. So I always have to explain that to people. We weren't the mob, but you know, we were mothers of boys. And so we did that together, just, just helping bringing together, um, other, other moms of boys who could speak into the hearts of moms. Because what we had found is that there was a shortage of material out there for moms who wanted to great, uh, raise godly men. There were lots of, there's lots of stuff out there for moms of, you know, of girls, but they're just at that time. And it's much better now. But at that time, there was this shortage for those of us who were trying our best to partner with God in raising these godly men. So we did that for a long time. And that's actually the ministry that gave me the ability to write my first book, which is called Praying for Boys. And prayer was Mm. always 
the heartbeat of that community. It was always the foundational concept that we built every other part of our ministry on. And so in 2019, we, uh, well, actually, probably in 2018, we felt like the Lord was saying, let's move into full-time prayer ministry. This is kind of what you're doing anyways. Um, we're just going to open it up to the moms of girls as well. And we're going to do something a little bigger than what, than what we've been doing. And so um, that's how Million Praying Moms was born. It was a desire for us to um, be able to share with the moms that we were already serving and those that we hadn't had the ability to reach yet, uh, the joy and the power of prayer of being a praying mom, not just being the kind of mom that's like, Lord, keep them safe. Lord, um, you know, bless them today. There's nothing wrong with that. But we wanted to specifically help moms learn to pray God's word for their children because there was mm. such power for us in that in our own lives. I'm doing the ministry solo now. My business partner took a, a different turn. God led her in a different direction. But that is still the heart of, of what we do at Million Praying Moms. That's awesome. And you're reaching so many and making such a big impact. And I invited you on the show, Brooke, because this season we're talking about choosing cheer in our everyday, ordinary life. So not in the highest of highs and not in the lowest of lows, but in our everyday moments, in our emptying the dishwasher, doing laundry, as uh, uh, shuttling kids to uh, soccer practice or whatever it might be, um, how are we finding and experiencing the joy of Jesus in those moments? And I feel like your ministry so addresses all of those things. Um, so I want to ask you, how can praying for our kids or families help us to experience the joy of Jesus in our everyday lives? Yeah, that's such a great question. I think what I have found over the years uh, as I have tried to understand prayer deeper and deeper and deeper as we've you know, been on this journey is that people generally come to prayer for one of two reasons. There, there may be others, but these are the ones I see over and over again. One is a sense of obedience because God tells us to pray, right? Like it's modeled for us in the scripture. Um, it's a, it's almost assumed that, that we will be in a praying prayerful relationship with the Lord, just as a part of being a Christian. If you, if you read the scriptures, there's less of, of a descriptive way, although we have the Lord's prayer. That's really the, one of the only examples we have of do it this way. It's really just assumed that as the, the believer grows and matures in the faith, they'll be praying. So we do it as a, as an act of obedience. That's one way that people come to prayer. That is not the way I came to prayer. I came to prayer and I wish it was. I wish I could go back and say, Oh, so holy. <laughs> I, I came to prayer because God said to, but actually the reason that I came to prayer was the number two reason. And that is out of desperation. I desperately needed the Lord to do something in my home. Um, my children were born very close together. They are what I like to call those boys. They are 250% boy. They are aggressive and impulsive and they are loud and they are full of energy and they bounce off the walls. Now they're older now, so it's, it's a little more controlled. But in, in the beginning, they would just bounce off the walls until it was bedtime. And then the only redeeming thing that I had about their early childhood is that they had so much energy, energy that they had wasted through throughout the day that they would pass out at night. They were, they were done. Like they just would pass out cold and they wouldn't wake up until in the morning. So that was like my one thing. Thank you, Lord. Cause I know a lot of moms struggle with sleep for, for their kids. That was not one of our struggles, but we had <laughs> plenty of others. So I was, I was completely worn out by them just in every way that you could think of. They kicked my feet out from under me in all of the right ways. They showed me perhaps for the first time how much I desperately needed Jesus on a day-to-day -day basis. Now I'd made a decision to follow Christ a long time before that. They didn't show me my need for salvation. I already had that. But they showed me this almost moment by moment need that I had to be in relationship with the Lord. And they showed me that I did not have the power to force them to be the kind of boys that I wanted them to be. <clears throat> I just, I didn't have that ability. I was going to have to rely on God to help me with that, to help me shepherd their hearts, or I was going to go crazy. I was just going to go crazy. And there were so many times in, in my early motherhood where I just, I went to sleep 
in tears thinking, I didn't do this the way I wanted to do this. I wasn't the kind of mom I wanted to be today. This is not what I thought it was going to look like, Lord. And it was it was devastating to a very goal-oriented girl who had always been able to achieve. Um, you know, if you look at my strengths finders, achievement is like toward the top. I, I, I'm a hard worker and I've always been able to get what I want by working hard enough. But there was this this realization that I could not work myself into um, having their hearts of of stone turned to hearts of flesh. That was God's job. And parenting is a heart issue. Parenting is reaching for the heart. We can try and force them into a mold, but I just happened to have two little boys that were very difficult to force to do anything. And so um, God really used that to show me and I was desperate for him. And when I began, praise the Lord, because I had been walking with, with him for a while, when I finally got to that very desperate season of my life, I knew where to go. So I went to his word and I said, Lord, I need you. I need you. My earliest prayers were, uh, help me, Jesus, at the top of my lungs. You know, I would just, my neighbors probably thought I was crazy because I would just scream it like, help me, Jesus, you know, right now. I need you right here, right now, Lord. And the cool thing is that he showed up. He showed up for me over and over again as I went to his word looking for for him, looking for what to pray for my kids. Then he showed up and I found so much joy and comfort and peace in trusting that God was going to do with his word in their hearts exactly what he wanted to do. There was almost like it was a, a relief to me to finally realize that I had a job to do in my parenting and that God had a job to do in the hearts of my kids and that they weren't the same and that I couldn't do his job for him, but I could partner, I could partner with him and say, Lord, show me what to do. Lord, be faithful to do this in my kids' hearts. And there was just so much peace in that for me. And really, peace is not that far from joy. For, for, a, for a mom that is, you know, desperate, peace looks a lot like joy, I think. And it did for me in the beginning. Yeah, that is so rich. I, I love what you said towards the beginning of that about power. You said, I realized I didn't have mm-hmm. the power to force them to be a certain way. Um, I immediately thought about the Holy Spirit when you said that because our prayers draw us closer to the Holy Spirit and recognizing God with us, God in us, and that's the power. Mm -hmm. It's nothing that we can overpower or do on our own self, but it's Him working in us through His Spirit. And that's such a strong reminder because I think, Brooke, what do you think about like the way that culture presents to us that we as moms have to have it all together and yeah. we have to um, be we have to be super mom. We have to do all the things and it's on us and we carry the load. We're trying to live up to these Instagram images of mothers. Yeah. I would my response to that is that one of the most pivotal moments of my life and and most certainly of my motherhood was when the Lord opened my eyes to the verses in second Corinthians where he's, you know, Paul is coming to him and saying, Lord, um, would you fix this weakness that I have? Would you take it away? And the Lord said, no, he said, no, I will not take it away. And, and his response to Paul was my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, and then Paul's response to that was, therefore, I will boast all the more about my, about my weaknesses, because when I am weak, then Christ is strong. I mean, that is just life changing for a mom who feels like she has to live up. In fact, in that moment, when the Lord opened my eyes to that truth, I had read those verses many times before, but you know, God does that, right? Like sometimes we just read something for the, for real, that we've read a hundred times, but we're reading it for the first time. And that's what happened to me in that moment. And I thought, wow, 
I'm going to boast in my weaknesses. So instead of trying to hide my weaknesses, which was the response that I had, you know, as a, as an achiever, as a perfectionist, as a, as a, as the one who had always kind of been the good girl growing up, I was mortified that I couldn't control my kids the way that I wanted to. And I wanted to hide that because it didn't look good. It didn't look perfect. But when God opened my eyes to that, it was like, I don't know if I ever would have done it myself, to be honest with you, but it was like the Holy Spirit just ripped the curtains of my heart open and said, boast in your weaknesses. Don't be ashamed of them because that is when the power of God will be made perfect in you. When you admit that you're weak and that you need Jesus, I will be strong for you. And so that was probably close to 16 years ago, 17 years ago now. And I have been boasting in my weaknesses ever since. In fact, that is really what Million Praying Moms is all about in some ways. It's me saying, I don't have what it takes. I can't do this, Lord. I need you. I need you. I need you every second of every day. I call it parenting. It's really my entire game plan for for parenting. I, you know, that's it. I'm going to pray and say, Lord, show me. And it's only when I came to the point when I recognized how weak I actually am and how much God's strength is so much better that I was able to get there. Wow, I was like about to bring tears to my eyes, Brooke. I have a two and a half year old um, who is not a boy. She's a little girl, but she is the strongest willed <laughs> little girl I, I have ever been around. Um, and I wonder where did she get it from, right? Now I'm pretty <laughs> strong willed myself, but um, she is so strong willed. And just this morning, she started kicking her feet in a temper tantrum, like. We've had the crying fallout of the twos, right? Mm -hmm. But the feet kicking was a new thing this morning. And I really, I just, she was laying on the floor and I just looked at her and I really was thinking to myself, I don't know what to do with her right now. And like, Lord, I, I literally, I looked at her on the ground and then I looked up and I said, Lord, I don't know what to do with her. Yeah. You know, and it's like, you're just at your end and you don't want to respond out of anger or frustration, which is so easy to do. And so often I look at her responses to things and I think, well, man, she just watched me respond mm -hmm. that same way to something else and mm -hmm. she's copying me. Yeah. Um, and so there's a weight that comes with that, but that sense of just honesty of and just need of going, she doesn't come with a manual. Yeah. Um, Lord, I need you. And each kid is so unique. Can I encourage you just there for a moment and any other, yes, please. Any other mom that might be listening <laughs> that can just really relate to that? Because, you know, I, I look back on that and, and I can smile now because my kids are 16 and 18 <laughs> and, and nobody's falling on the floor having a tantrum anymore. They have tantrums in other ways as teenagers, but they're, they're not literally <laughs> falling on the floor anymore. But, but in the moment of that, it's so real. It is so disconcerting and painful and, and, and just like you feel like all the things that you know to be true. Like, what is, what does that even matter right now? Because I don't know how to handle this. I can't make this stop. And so I, my kids did that too. One of my children in particular, um, there were so many days when he was younger that I would carry him up the stairs of our home kicking and screaming and he would bite me and hit me. And it was, it was, it was like he just lost control of himself in the beginning. Like I was bruised emotionally from that, but I was also bruised physically from that. And I would, I would go upstairs to his room and I couldn't even get him to stay in his room. There was, there was no quiet time with this kid. Like you couldn't put him in timeout. It, it just, he wouldn't stay. And so I would literally sit on the floor with him and just like put him in a full body lock to, to protect myself <laughs> in many ways. And I would just rock him back and forth and sing to him. I would just sing and sing and rock and rub his hair until he could calm down enough that he could actually hear what I was saying past all of the, the noise of his tantrum. And I did that so many times for him. And several years ago when he was, I don't know, maybe around 12 or 13 years old, um, we had a conversation. We had had a, a, he and I had had a disagreement that day 
And we had kind of what I call a come to Jesus moment where we had to sit down and be like, look, this is not okay. This has to stop. You know, you're being disrespectful. And he looked at me and he said, mom, I feel like there's something more going on here. Like, I feel like you're mad at me for more than just what happened. And I looked at him, I was sitting on the floor and he was sitting in our recliner so that I could be more eye to eye with him. And I looked at him and I said, sweetie, I just feel like this has been going on forever. Like I'm, I'm just tired. I'm tired of having these same conversations over and over and over again. And I reminded him of the way that, of what I just described to you, of the way that it had been when he was a younger boy. And as I described to him the way that was, the how hard that was for me, his mouth just fell open. And finally, he looked at me and he said, I never did that to you. I would never treat you that way. <laughs> And I realized in that moment that he doesn't remember like yeah. that, that part of our parenting journey that was so hard for me, that just ripped my soul out. And really that, that was what caused me to go to God in prayer in the first place. He doesn't remember any of it. So I'm telling you that as an encouragement that just to keep pressing on, keep praying, keep doing all the things that you know to do, you may have to do it over and over and over and over and over again. There's not going to be this magic thing that you do that's going to make everything better or make it change, but it's going to get better over time. So I just wanted to pause and encourage in that for a second because I've definitely been there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I know that uh, listeners are saying thank you as well as they're relating and understanding that. And I love what you said um, that your boys don't throw t- tantrums anymore, but maybe in a little bit of a different way. Right. And I think that's an important part of motherhood and, and praying for your children as well. Um, I serve as a youth pastor for a long time. And so that teenage language um, sometimes is not that far away from that three-year-old uh, language. Mm-hmm. But, you know, how our prayers change in the season that our kids mm-hmm. are in and the season of life that we are in. And that's a, a really unique part, I feel like, yeah. of our journey as mothers. So the person who's listening to this and is thinking, this all sounds really great, and you've given some examples, but what are some practical steps Mm -hmm. that people can take to begin to practice praying for their families? Yeah, so many of the moms that I deal with or that I have the pleasure of dealing with will come to me and say, Brooke, I know I ought to be praying. Like, I, you know, we talked about this earlier. I can see it in scripture. I know I ought to be praying. Um, I want to pray. I want to be a vibrant prayer warrior. I believe that prayer is is a very important part of my motherhood for the, the hearts of my kids. I just don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. It feels awkward. And and I sometimes don't even feel like anybody's listening or, or, or maybe they come to me and say, well, I've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing has happened. And I, I don't know if I really believe that God's listening. We have, There's lots of challenges that we bring to the table with prayer. And I want the first thing that I want to say is that you're not alone in that. Lots of people struggle with prayer. Sometimes I still struggle with prayer. And, and I think that is the norm. It really is more the norm than it is the, the other way around. And so I want to encourage your listeners to know that if they're struggling, they're definitely not alone. Um, I actually wrote a resource, a couple of resources that I think would be great. One is free. So I'll point us in the direction there first. It's actually a little downloadable ebook that's called How to Pray God's Word for Your Children. And it's super short. It's just a little how-to guide that like, if you if you grab it, you'll be praying God's Word for your children by this afternoon. It's just that it's it's very, very quick and easy. And it explains how I approach this from A to Z. But in a nutshell, what I do, uh, what I what I have done in the past and what I do today is look to God's word to show me what I need to pray for my kids. So in different seasons of their lives, our kids have different character traits that are sinful or or that we wish were different. And they change throughout the years. Sometimes there are character traits that stay the same and they just kind of morph and change over the years, but but sometimes they're different. And so I find that this is helpful to do periodically, not just once. So I'll make a list of the things that we're struggling with in our in, that my kids are struggling with. And it generally starts out negative. Like I might say, well, they're angry or they're being disobedient or, um, you know, whatever, fill in the blank with whatever your child is dealing with right now, or they're impatient, um, that kind of stuff. And then what I like to try and do is flip that so that it's actually the biblical positive of that. 
So instead of just praying, Lord, would you help them not be impatient or not, you know, be angry? I'm actually looking for God's word to show me how to pray for them to have joy, how to pray for them to be obedient, how how to pray for them to be patient instead. So I'm flipping it and then I'm going to God's word. Just I usually just use the concordance in the back of my Bible and I look for verses that have to do with those specific things. And here's the important part. There are going to be some verses that you could use that may not apply directly to what you're dealing with. I always just want to give people a warning to try very hard not to take God's word out of context, because Isaiah 55 11 tells us that God's word will not return void, that it will do exactly what he purposes for it to do. But if we take it out of context, I don't feel like that verse applies. So we have to make sure that we're being true to what God's word is actually saying in that particular instance. And then once I've found those verses, then I just write them down and I turn them into a prayer. One by one, I just turn them into a prayer. I call it creating a scripture inspired prayer. It isn't always word for word. Sometimes there are verses that really lend that like are already written as a prayer and, and those are easy to just use the way they are. But other times I need to change it a little bit to make it a, a prayer. And so I'll do that. And then I'll just weave them together into one big long prayer. And when they were smaller, I used to print these out and frame them and hang them outside of their doors. And so every night my, my husband and I would go in and pray for them. And then when we came out of their rooms and we shut the doors, we would literally lay hands on the doors and pray this big, long scripture inspired prayer for our children. And that's how I started praying God's word. Super practical, super not rock, rocket science. It is it is not hard to do. It just requires a few minutes of your time to make this list and go to God's word and find what you need. And that whole process, along with some sample prayers, um, are in that free resource called How to Pray God's Word for Your Children. So that would be a great place that to start. That is awesome. That is awesome. I am going to go download that this afternoon uh, <laughs> to get started on that. That is that is just great. Um, thank you for that. And I, I wanna ask, okay, so you began doing that process mm-hmm. with your kids. How did you tell, like, could you begin to tell your prayers were, I hate to say working, mm-hmm. that's not really how we really wanna look at prayer, but your prayers are being answered or mm-hmm. what did that process look like of going like, wow, this is really making a difference for my family. Mm-hmm. I wanna keep doing this and yeah. I want to encourage others to do the same right. thing. I look at this, you're not the first person that's asked me this question. I think mm-hmm. we're such a results oriented society that it's just this very natural question. If, if someone is going to change the way they approach their life, uh, they want to know that it's going to work. And, and if you're coming like I did to prayer out of desperation, you really want God to do something like you need him to do something right now. And so the answer, the way that I like to answer this question is by likening it to a math equation. A plus B equals C, right? If you're a math person, you know that every single time A plus B equals C, always. It never changes. It always equals that. But if you change one variable in the equation, let's say that mom represents the A. If you change her in any way, the outcome, whether B stays the same or not, the outcome changes, It will change. So you may not necessarily see a radical instantaneous change in your home immediately. But if you change you, the outcome of your home will change. I promise you that. I went to God's word in prayer desperately because I wanted God to change my children. I didn't realize that God was going to change me. And that's really what happened first and foremost. I started praying because I didn't know what to do and because I wasn't being the kind of mother that I wanted to be. Now, I'm certainly not perfect. Now, 18, 19 years later, I'm certainly not a perfect mom, but I look a whole lot more like the mom I wanted to be back then because I have gone to God's word over and over again, and it has changed me. Now, 20 year, almost 20 years later, there are definitely some answers to prayer that we have, but it took a while to get there. It took perseverance and it took, you know, this, this idea that I'm going to trust that God values my prayers and that he hears my prayers. And, and that if he says, if he says, wait, 
then that's okay because he's God and I'm not. And this is the hard one. If he says no, which he has a right to do, that is a legitimate answer to prayer, um, then I'm, I'm still going to trust him because he is God and I'm not. Being a mother, a woman of prayer has totally transformed the way that I see the work of God in the world and especially in my kids' lives. So that's just been a, a huge part of my story. And that's why I'm so passionate about telling other moms about it, because there's nothing special about me. There's nothing like this is not a work that God just chose to do in me as if I'm, you know, separate from everyone else or better than everyone else. God offers this to every single person listening right now. And even those that are not, if you press in in prayer, if you go to his word to look for what to pray, if you decide that you're going to stand on it and trust him, he will do the same thing in you. Right. And that's such a neat thing that I think can be really applied broader than just motherhood, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yes. I mean, this could be in your marriage. Um, you know, like you said, the A plus B equals C. If you've got A as me and B as my spouse, mm -hmm. the same kind of thing happens, right? You stop focusing on trying to change them and look to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to change your heart. And that can be applied in all kinds of ways in our lives. And we begin to see God at work in us and, and a change as the result of that. Absolutely. So last question for you, Brooke. What do you think steals our joy or keeps us from praying for our families? And how do we overcome those things? Yeah, I think this is a two-part question and I'll try to make it fast. Mm -hmm. One, I think we don't have an understanding of what true biblical joy is. I think we look for joy in the wrong places and in the wrong ways. And uh, we actually have a resource at Million Praying Moms called Everyday Prayers for Joy. You can pick that up and it will walk you through in 30 days what the actual biblical definition of joy is and help you pray for that in your own life and in, in the hearts of your children. Um, so I, I highly recommend spending the time yeah. to figure out what that actually looks like. Um, but I think secondarily, we are so busy uh, it, for legitimate reasons. We have small children. We have busy lives. We have busy careers. We're involved in the community. We're involved in the, in the church. Our children are tantruming every day. Uh, you know, there are, there are legitimate things that we are doing, ways that we are spending our time, God honoring ways that we're spending our time that are making it very difficult for us to do the important things, the important spiritual disciplines of our lives. And so oftentimes what I have found is that it's a simple mindset switch that instead of allowing those things to keep us from prayer, we decide that we are going to um, use those things to propel us toward prayer instead. So it's an awareness. Uh, it's it's yeah. asking God, maybe first and foremost, to say, Lord, make me aware of when the right times would be when I'm feeling stressed, when I'm feeling like it's chaotic, when I'm feeling rushed, um, instead of just feeling that and moving on, would you help me, Lord? Would you train me to actually come to you in that moment and say, Lord, I'm feeling rushed. I'm feeling stressed. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Would you, you know, would you minister to me? Would you remind me of truth in this situation? So it's looking at it differently. It's the mindset sh shift but then also asking the Lord to show us his truth in that moment instead of just speeding on by and, and missing an opportunity. Right. I had somebody um, ask me the other day as a younger woman who's in my life, doesn't have kids yet, is not married yet. And she asked me a question um, basically to the effect of because my daughter Josie was having a um, rough time or a rough day, that it basically made me, like she made an assumption that it would make me not happy, mm -hmm. right? And so I had a minute of just going, you know what? Um, I really, really try to not let her, the way that she is feeling, of course it affects you mm -hmm. as a mother, mm -hmm. right? But I can't let my emotional state be dictated by a two and a half year old right. um, because I am supposed to be leading her as her mother. <laughs> and so it was like a light bulb went off and my friend uh, that I was talking to because she, it was like, she'd never thought about it that way, you know? And I just thought, you know, that's so true of us. This is what we talk about week after week on the podcast. Our theme verse is John 16, 33, where Jesus tells his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. 
but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And it's this idea that our joy isn't rooted in our circumstance, but it's rooted in Him, in Jesus, and the strength and the power that we get from Him as being His followers. And so I think that um, it's easy to think about circumstances as these big things external things that are happening in our lives and not as much about our day-to-day interactions with our kids or our spouse. And so to think about those things as, okay, if my joy is truly rooted in Jesus, it doesn't get disturbed by these little bumps in the road. And so to have that as um, kind of a, a guide that we know where our joy comes from allows us to be more joyful in our homes and to create more joy in our homes So that's such a great reminder for, especially uh, with our theme on the podcast, just right in line with that, Brooke. I just thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. And if we recognize too, that um, joy is is not, uh, it's not necessarily a feeling. And I know that sounds odd, but it's not. Scripture defines joy as a fruit. It is the fruit of of the spirit. In other words, we are all believers have at least a, a, a seed of joy in us simply because we belong to Jesus. And so even if you're struggling to find joy right now, if you're struggling to be loving towards your kids, um, if you're struggling to find peace in any of the fruit of the spirit, um, you have it there. It's actually already there. And with all, as with all fruits, with all plants, a little bit of love and attention can help grow those things into something bigger. So it's helpful to me to remember that when I don't feel joy, it doesn't actually mean that I'm living in a joyless place. It just means my eyes are on the wrong things and I'm not choosing to give love and attention to what God has already planted in my heart. That is so beautiful. That is so beautiful, Brooke. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I have learned so much and have been encouraged in such a real way. And I know our listeners will feel the same. Thank you for your work. You guys make sure that you follow her. It's at Million Praying Moms, right? Yes. On Instagram. Yeah, yes. you can find her there and her website. I will link everything in the show notes. We want you to follow her and be encouraged by the work that she is doing. And just thank you, Brooke, for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Friends, it's my honor and privilege to get to spend time with you week after week. It is such a joy that you would choose to be a part of our conversation here on the podcast. You are such an important part of what we do. If you like what you hear, I would invite you to share it, pass it along, text this episode to a friend, like, rate, and subscribe to our show. What you do makes a difference. And remember, friend, we're cheering you on.